Hey, hi, Alicia. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so I think it's just you right now. Okay. You can get started with your questions. Okay, I had questions on the nomenclature. Is that how you say it? Uh, nomenclature? Nomenclature, there we go. Yes. Um, I guess I'm having trouble understanding when we use the Roman numerals versus um, okay. the prefix. Okay, so basically if we look at all our uh, compounds, we got, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so we got ionic compounds. Oops. Okay, so we, we got, why is this not working? Oh. Just give me a second, okay. Okay, so yeah. So we have ionic compounds and then we have our molecular or we also call them covalent. Okay. okay. So under ionic, we got two types. We got our type one and type two and this is based on the metal, okay? We got type one metal and we got type two metal. All right, okay. so I'll give you examples first. Here we have example NaCl. For type two, we have this FeCl2. And then for molecular covalent, we got CO2, okay? You can see we got these three different uh, examples. Uh, one is, two of them are ionic, one of them is covalent. Uh, how do we know which one is which? You see this one, sodium chloride, metal, non-metal. So uh, metal with a non-metal. Then here also it's a metal with a non-metal. Right? And then when it comes to covalent, it's non-metal and non-metal. Okay. So whenever it's covalent or molecular, when you have two non-metals together, that's when you're going to use fixes. So prefixes are always there when you have a covalent or a molecular compound. If it's ionic, never try to use prefixes. So never think of calling this guy iron dichloride. Okay. Okay, because it's ionic. These guys do not take prefixes. All right. Uh, so between type one and type two, Type one, you see, what do you call this guy? You just call the sodium chloride. So you realize that you're not using parentheses here. Okay. But when you come to type two, you have to use parentheses. So this one needs parentheses. Type two. Okay. Yeah, type two needs parentheses. Type one does not need parentheses. And of course, covalent molecular don't need parentheses. They need, because they have prefixes. Okay, so how do we know when to use this uh, prefix like "id" on yeah. when to use what? The "id." You know how you were saying it's "ite" or "ide." Okay, so "ite" and "ate" because we have not covered polyatomic ions yet. Okay. You don't have to worry about them for right now for this exam tomorrow. Okay, so tomorrow everything is going to end with IDE. I got it. Okay. Okay. Okay, that I, now I have a better understanding of this. That's good. I'm getting confused of when we use non metal mm -hmm. with metal and where to use what. So now I get it. Yes, thank you. That's good. That's good. Okay, I think we got some more students. We'll take their questions as well. Okay, so anyone else, do you guys have any questions for me? You can ask questions. You can even 
put your questions in your chat if you guys want. Well, see, do you have more questions? What was that? Do you have any more questions? If you have more questions, you can ask me. So I'm a little confused on when we could use the cross, the crisscross on the ionic. Um, formula uh -huh. and we cannot. So that's the top to bottom crisscross you can always use under ionic okay? okay so let's say the question is tell me the formula for aluminum chloride aluminum chloride okay now uh, if you want to write the formula for aluminum chloride you're given the name so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to find the charge for each one. You're going to write the symbol and their charge. That's going to be your first step. The second step is crisscross. So whenever you are in this region, whenever you're doing the ionic compounds, you can always do crisscross. But at the end, make sure that you bring them down to lowest whole number ratio if required. Okay. So let's do this example. Aluminum chloride. So the first thing we're going to do is write the symbol. Aluminum is Al. Now, do you know what is the charge of aluminum? Can you tell that from the periodic table? Yes, it's a plus three. It's a plus three, so we'll write here plus three. And then chloride, what about chloride? Chloride is negative one. Negative one. So now if you do the crisscross, you put this three down here, and you put this one down here. So you get Al and one, you don't have to put a one. And then you say Cl and then the three, so AlCl3. So this crisscross is always gonna work the only thing you have to be careful about is to bring them down to the lowest whole number ratio. What does that mean? So let's say we got another example. Uh -huh, let me think. So lead or oxide. Okay. Okay. So we got lead for oxide. This is a four. So lead four oxide, if we're gonna now do the formula, formula we're gonna lead, lead, what's the symbol for lead? The PB, okay. And then four is the, what is this four telling us? Charge. Charge. So PB is plus four. That's what this number is telling us here. See, for aluminum chloride, for aluminum, when I asked you the charge, you looked into the periodic table, right? And that's the right thing to do. For lead, if I ask you what is the oxidation state or the charge, you can't tell that from periodic table. That's why you were given that already in the name. Okay. So lead, PB, and then plus four is the charge. It's given in the name. And then we go to oxide. What does oxide mean? It's oxygen with how much charge? What's the charge on oxygen? Negative two. Okay, so now if you do the crisscross, what do we get? So if I do the crisscross, what should I write here? PB. Is it number two? Yeah, so two. And then O, what do we say here? Four. Four, okay. Now you see the, these are not the lowest whole number ratio. We can actually get rid of this two. So we can actually divide this by two and this also by two. And this will give us PB1 and O2. That's what we mean by bringing down to the lowest whole number ratio. Okay, so when you see that you have two numbers which can be divided by the smallest number to get an even smaller number, then you do that step. So when we do these 
crisscross, it always has to be positive, right? When you do the crisscross, the numbers in the bottom, yes, because numbers in the bottom are just telling us that how many we got, and how many is always going to be positive. Hi, Amon. How are you? Hey, good man. What about you? Good. I'm trying to catch up because apparently I had a hard time logging into the session today. Oh, okay. So, so what? Which are we cov Which are, what are we covering right now? Ionic bonds? Yeah, somebody had a question on um, nomenclature. So we yeah, that, yeah, I'm getting stuck on that too as well. Okay, so yeah, I can see now there are some more students. I'll quickly go over what I covered earlier and then we'll take questions, okay? Okay. So we got ionic compounds and molecular covalent compounds. These are two compounds that we do two types of compounds you're going to see tomorrow on your. Mm -hmm. So ion right. is when you have metal and a non-metal. So metal, right. a non-metal, and then when you have non-metal and non-metal, that's what you have. That's when you call it covalent or molecular. Okay. For covalent molecular, you use prefixes. Keep that in mind. Mono di tri only okay. is used for covalent molecular. Never use mono di tri for ionic compounds. Okay. So yes. we only use Roman numerals in ionic bonds, right? Yes, Roman numerals are when you have type two. So when you have type two, that's when you use parentheses and in parentheses you put the Roman numeral. Okay. So not just all the ionics. Ionic only type two needs parentheses. Type one does not need parentheses. Okay. Like you see this example, sodium chloride, aluminum right. chloride, they don't have parentheses because they're type one. Now you see okay. this example, lead four oxide, this one is type two, that's why it has a parentheses. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm asking, I'm looking for more questions, guys. Ask me more questions. Um, could you like another thing to, oh, well, have we go first. Um, could you go over scientific notation again? Scientific notation, okay. Yes. Yeah, does anyone have any question on nomenclature? Uh, I still do, kind of. Yeah. So you can ask your nomenclature first, and then I'll go to scientific notation, okay? Like, for example, Amon, where I'm also getting confused with is, like, on hydrocytes, like, writing it out, basically, when you have, why do you have to put the OH in parentheses? Like, basically, when you do that stuff. So, as I mentioned in the class, tomorrow you guys are not getting tested on polyatomic ions. Okay, polyatomic ions are not getting tested just on... Yeah. Okay, just basically on nomenclature, like how you just said right now. Yeah, only ionic and covalent known polyatomic ions. And polyatomic ions are the one who need parentheses and then you put a number. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're asking or something else? Yeah, I'm looking also at my exercise C right now because I had a few questions on that as well. Where where I'm getting stuck is also like, for example, where is that page at? On page 116, when you have to name um, the molecular compounds. Okay. What's the example? Like for the example with, um, with like carbon tetrachloride, that's where I'm getting stuck at because I know C is carbon mm -hmm. and I know that, that tetra means four and that chloride, of course, is Cl. Right. Why is it that, um, like, I'm getting confused with, like, the formula part when you write out into a formula? Yeah, I just wrote that. So, okay. carbon tetra chloride, if it's already, if you already know carbon is C, tetra right. means you have chlorine and you have four of them. So, that's how you write it down. That's it. Okay. So, basically, when you see, like, for example, diarsenic pentasulfide, you yeah. just write AS2, SF, basically, right? That That's all you have to do, basically, on stuff like that? Right. Okay. Okay. So that's where I was getting stuck. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, somebody had a question on scientific notation, so I'll quickly go over yeah, that. Yeah, I'll follow along, too, because I'm getting okay. stuck on that, too. Sure. So, let's say you got this number, okay? 232.46 times 10 to the power 3. Right. Okay. And we want to change this to into a scientific notation. 
Okay. First of all, uh, whoever asked me this question, I, was it Alicia, you? No, I think it was somebody else. Somebody else? Okay, whoever that was. So uh, what do we mean by sign fragmentation? Uh, you see the decimal right now is sitting here. We don't like the decimal sitting just anywhere because if it's here, it could be anywhere. The rule is that we always want it to be between the first two numbers. And the right. first number does not have to be zero. Okay? So you cannot say this. You have to say this. So we cannot yeah. say 0 0.3. You have to say 3.0 and then modify the exponent. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, our, our decimal right now is here. We want to move this decimal uh, two places. Okay? We want to call this 2.3246. That's what we want to call this guy. Time, okay. now if we look at our powers, uh, we want to make these two numbers equal, right? This number and this number, they have to be same number. So we got to change the Because we changed the decimal, we got to change this power. Since we made this 2.3246, the way I've been teaching this in the class, if you mm -hmm. make this number small, you're making this number sad, okay? When you make yeah. this number small, you made it sad. So you have right. to make this number happy. Okay, so 10 to the power of 3, you have to make it happy. Happy means you're going to make it bigger. Right. Okay, so how many places did we move the decimal? Two. Two places. So we got to increase this by 2. So it's going to be 10 to the 5th? Right? 10 to the 5th, yes. Okay, so that's a sign for notation. Now, let's see another example. I'll take the same number, but I'll change the power. From 10 to the power of 3 to 10 to the power of negative 3. Now let's let's see what to do, okay? Again, we want to change this into a scientific notation, so we'll do the same thing. We'll make it 2.3246 times 10 to the power. Now what should we do with the power? You can see again we moved our decimal places twice. So we again made our number small. We made this number small. We got to make this number bigger. How do you make this negative 3 bigger? Do you make it negative it one or do make Five. Don't you make it positive one? No, not positive one. By positive one, you're you're moving your decimal four places. Okay. Make you make it negative one. Okay. So you make it negative one because you moved it two places, so you gotta you gotta lower this by two, or you gotta make this bigger by two. So you made this number smaller. Two thirty two became two point three two. Ten to negative three has to become ten to the negative one because now it's negative one is bigger than negative three. Does that answer the question, whoever asked? If you have more questions, let me know. Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. okay, so I'm waiting for more questions, guys. Um, conversion problems. I keep on getting stuck with those. What kind exactly? Like when you have to convert... Um, centimeters or centimeters cubed basically or milliliters to liters something like that yeah i'm getting stuck on those two so you so you want to move from centimeter cube to liters will that mm -hmm. be a problem well isn't that one both aren't they one or no no they're not one ml is one centimeter cube right not one liter okay Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so if we have, let's say, this number, so 468.462 centimeter cube, and we want to change this number into a liter. So, the first thing you're going to do, guys, is in your head, you have to do your conversion. So like, right. what's the path going to be? So, can somebody suggest to me the path? You, we already just learned this, that one of them is one centimeter cube. Right. So what should we do here? Shouldn't we start from centimeters cube or one milliliter? We yeah, should probably so start from one milliliter, right? So change it to milliliters and from milliliters you can go to liters, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So your first step is you just take this number, 468.462 centimeter cube. And we want to change centimeter cubes into liter. We can see it's going to be two steps. So we already made two uh, convergence for us. So what should I put here, guys? What unit should I put here in the bottom? Uh, centimeters cubed, right? 
the centimeter cube. And then here we got milliliter. So the other one, we put milliliters here and liters here. Mm -hmm. so one and one, one ml is one centimeter cube. And then between liter and milliliter, what's the conversion? Um, one, of course, is liters because that's bigger. Right. And then 10 to the power. 10 to the power. Milli is negative three, so this has to be plus three, okay? Yeah, right. Liter is 10 to the zero, so milliliter is going to be 10 to the three. Okay. So now when you got this, your units are canceled, and you're left with 468.462 times 10 to the power. What I'm going to do now is move this up. I'm moving this guy up. So I got to make this negative three. Okay. Okay. So now, since you got this answer, this is in liters, of course. We got to change this into a scientific notation, 4.68462 times 10 to the power how much? Um, uh, you moved it two decimal places, correct? Right. So is it 10 to the negative one power? Yeah, negative one liter. So that's your final answer. Amon, quick question for you. Uh -huh. Why did you move the 10 to the third to the top? I mean, that's one. how you will solve it, right? Or you can just plug this into calculator. 468.462 divided by 10 to the power of 3. Just put that on calculator and you should get the same answer. Okay, that's where I got. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have any other question on this, on unit conversion especially? Um, yeah, let me see if I can find it. Like, um, like when you... Um, which when you do um degree celsius to fahrenheit degree celsius to fahrenheit yes okay so now you are going to be given the uh conversion factors right so you don't have to memorize the conversion factor for these okay so if we are given let's say a temperature and then let's say the temperature is 38.42 degrees Celsius, and you want to change this into a Fahrenheit. So your degree, so the formula for degree Fahrenheit is 1.8 times whatever temperature is in Celsius plus 32. Okay. Okay. So so you just plug in 1.8 times whatever temperature is in Celsius, 38.42. That's given in the question. This is, oh, sorry. Okay. This is in the question. The Celsius temperature, and then you add thirty-two to that. Will that so be given to us on the test? Yes, you'll be given the conversion. Okay. Yeah. So then you do the math, and then you'll get the final answer. And this one you want sig figs too, right, Amon? Or no? Yeah. Yes, always sig figs. All you always got to worry about your sig figs. Okay, because. Because there's two sig figs, that's the least amount of sig figs I see. Yeah, the question has four sig figs. Really? Yeah, you see this number has four, but you got to look at each step. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're this. See this in the conversion factor. This number one point eight and thirty two. These are not mm -hmm. going to limit your answer. So whatever right. answer you're going to get here, that's what it's going to decide because these numbers are exact numbers so they're not going to affect your sig figs so your sig figs will be coming from this so which is four significant figures okay so if you do the math 1.8 times 38.42 that's 69.156 plus 32 so you're going to add 32 to this and you get 101.156 now your question says only four sig figs, so you can only keep four sig figs. Now you see in this question, you don't need to go back at each step because again, this 1.8 is exact number and this 32 is an exact number. So they, they don't affect your significant figures. Right. Okay, so your answer is gonna be 101.2. Okay, so another thing too, I was wondering too because um, you said there's four significant figures. Why didn't you go with two if they're the least amount in that case over the four? Are you talking about this 1.8? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. So this 1.8 is an exact number. 
Remember? Oh, okay, yeah. If, you, if, you, if I count that there are 70 students in the class, then you don't say that that 70 has only one significant figure. You say it's infinite. Right. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, can you show us um, like the protons, electrons, and neutrons when they mm -hmm. have a, pos or ne a positive or a negative charge? Right. Is that isotopes? Yeah. So she, so she has a question not on isotope, but she has a question on ions when you have a charge or no charge. Am I right? Okay. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, okay. that's why I wanted to know also. Okay. So let's say you got different examples. Okay. Let's say we have nitrogen. Uh, and then we have a nitrogen with a negative three charge, okay? okay? So let's first see how many protons, neutron, and electron does our nitrogen have. So if we look at our periodic table, let me open the periodic table. We're looking for nitrogen, right? Yeah, so because nitrogen has three a negative three charge. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. So here's your periodic table. So here's your nitrogen. So for nitrogen, it says there's seven and then fourteen point zero one. Just okay. by that case, can you tell which one is atomic number and which one is atomic mass? Isn't atomic number the seven and the atomic mass, isn't it the 14.01? Yes, because the smaller number is always atomic number. So if I had to write this down, this is what I can say, seven and then 14, okay? Also, this guy is seven and 14. That's how you can write down the symbol. I wouldn't bring up the point zero uh one yeah so for only for this chapter okay when we go to next chapter for next week uh we will be copying the exact number from the periodic table but right now since our job is going to be to count how many neutrons uh if i put here 14.01 and then later i find the difference being 7.01 then if i say that i have 7.01 neutrons that's incorrect because you cannot have 7.01 neutrons. You can either have 7 or you can have 8. Okay? So that's why we just rounded off to the closest whole number. Just for this chapter. Okay? Okay. Right. So, basically, that's, so basically that's how it's done? You don't do anything else? No, no, no. Yeah. Now you got to answer how many protons, neutrons, and electrons you got, right? Okay, yeah. That's what I thought. So how many protons do we have? Um, isn't seven and aren't the number of protons and neutrons the same? Uh, I mean, in this case, they are, but they don't have to be. So, what do you look at is this number here, the number atomic number that tells you the That's number of protons, which is seven. seven. Neutrons is 14 minus seven, which is, which is seven. Protons. Your electrons are equal to number of protons if you have a neutral atom. Right. Now, is this nitrogen neutral? Yes, it is. So it's protons and electrons are equal, seven and seven. Okay. Then we go to our next example, which is N negative three. How many protons does this guy have? Seven. How many neutrons does this guy have? Same, 14 minus seven, so seven. Now, how many electrons does this guy have? See, when you see a N negative three, that negative three means it has extra negative, right? If it has extra negative, who is negative among proton, neutron, and electron? Electron is the one who is negative. So we know that we could add these three uh, negative three, so negative three so we could add three electrons. So we were supposed to have seven electrons because we had seven protons. Right? Mm -hmm. But because this guy is negative three, we gotta add three electrons and make this now ten electrons. Okay. 
So when you have ions, like negative or positive ions, a uh, number of protons and neutrons do not change. It's the number of electrons that change. Right. Okay. Does that answer the question? Who asked me the question? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. I think I was getting confused because I wanted to bring the whole um, atomic number in the equation. What do you mean by that? So, I was trying you... to bring in the 14.01. Uh -huh. oh, okay, to find the number of neutrons? Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, since you just found it to the nearest whole number for this. Yeah, now it's a whole number, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. And Can if you give another example? So if it's going to be here, let's say calcium positive 2, okay, let's do that example now. So find out proton, neutron, electron. I'll go to the periodic table and look for calcium. This is calcium right here, 20. And 40.08, this is going to round up to 40, of course, right? Not 41. So it's going to be 40. So we got 20 and 40 for calcium. Calcium is 20, 40. So 20 in the bottom and 40 on the top. Okay. So now how many protons do you think calcium has? 20. 20 protons. How many neutrons? 40 minus 20. So 40 minus 20, which is 20. And how many electrons do we have? How many electrons? Would it be 18 because we're subtracting two from... 20? Exactly, exactly. So we should have 20 electrons, but because this is positive two, we have lost negativity. We have lost negative charge. We have lost two negative charges. So we have lost two electrons. So it should have been 20, but we uh, lost two. So that's why we got 18. Why is it you lost two negative charges? What's that? Why is it that you lost two negative charges? Oh, no, no, no. That's already, that's what the question is. If if it lost two electrons, that's why it has a plus two. Oh, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Plus, opposite meaning negative and negative yes. meaning positive. So it's the opposite, right? It's the opposite. So when it says plus two, don't add two electrons. Instead, remove two electrons. Okay. When it's negative two, don't subtract two electrons. Instead, add electrons. Because again, this plus and minus has nothing to do with addition subtraction. This positive plus two and negative two has to do with the charge, positive and negative charge. A positive charge means you lost something who was negative. And a negative charge means you gained some, somebody who was negative, okay? And that negative guy is actually electron. So that's why it's the number of electrons that keep changing when we have ions. Okay. Isn't the number of protons and neutrons always the same? Uh, not always. Let's see our product table and see when it's not going to be same. Okay. Look at vanadium. Do you see vanadium? Mm -hmm. You see vanadium is 23. Yes. The double of 23 is 46, right? Yeah. This guy's not 46. This guy's 51 instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when they round up, because of the 9 after the 50, right? right. Yeah, so we got 23 and 51, okay? So okay. vanadium is 23 and 51, right? That's what it was. Right. Vanadium, 50, 23 and 51. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now tell me how many protons does this guy have? 23? Yes. How many neutrons does this guy have? 1 minus 23, right? Yeah. Which is equal to? 31. 28. 20. So 28. Now you see they're different? Proton, neutron, yeah. neutron, different? Okay. So far they were just being same just by a chance, okay? But they can be different. As the atoms get bigger and bigger, they can have a different number of protons and neutrons, okay? Okay. okay. And let's say this was vanadium plus 2, okay? Now tell me how many electrons do you think this guy has? Um, Medium plus two should have how many electrons? One. How many? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Yeah, twenty-one. Yeah. It should have twenty-three, but because of that plus two, that means we lost two electrons. So you remove two. Subtract two. So if it didn't have the plus two, the number of electrons would be the same number of protons? Yeah, so if the example was 23 and 51, 
then if we look for our protons, it will be 23, or neutrons, or 28, and electrons will be 23, same as the protons. Okay. Because so, basically, because you took the two neutrons away in the last example, that's why you got 21, right? Two electrons away, yeah. Yeah, okay. And in this case, the electrons would be 23, right? In the example you were just doing right now? Yeah. Okay. Can you do it with the negative charge? What's that? Can you do it with the negative charge, just as an example? Yeah, we just did negative. And negative 3. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so then that's why you added 10 right there? Yeah, that's why it has 10. Instead of 7, it has 10. Oh, okay, because you added three. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Do you have more questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, on the periodic table, can you um go over how you're supposed to find the charges for like the middle yeah. group with the transitional metals? See, see, the the middle ones, these ones. Yeah. Uh, they don't have a fixed charge. Okay. Okay. So their partner is going to decide their charge. Okay. Okay. So let's do an example, okay? Okay. Let's say we got this V2. Right. You see V is transition metal. It's among those, right? Now, for this guy, we don't know the charge. So the partner is going to get a charge. Okay. Okay. Don't, I think somebody is putting their keypad too strong or your cell phone. I mean, your pen. Yeah, a lot of disturbance. Okay. So V205. Uh, this is uh, vanadium. So vanadium, we do not have a fixed charge. So we got to find its charge from its partner. So if I ask you to name this guy, okay? Then what you're going to do is, uh, you're going to divide this molecule into two halves. Okay. This compound into two halves, okay? So we don't know vanadium's charge. See, if this was aluminum chloride, and I ask you for the name, you just say this is aluminum chloride. Mm -hmm. Why do you not have to tell me that it's aluminum three chloride? Because it's type one, right? Mm -hmm. But when it's type two, like this vanadium, we got to find its charge and its charge is going to come from here. Let's see. Oxygen uh, is, uh, what's charge on oxygen? Negative two charge. Negative two and there are five of them. So there's negative 10 charge. If this side is negative 10, so this side here is negative 10, this side will be how much? Positive? One? Positive 10. Okay. This is negative 10, so this is positive 10, okay? Uh -huh. Does that make sense, guys? How is it? Does that make sense or no? Um, is it, did it become negative 10 because you pretty much neutralized it or why? Yeah, so... Okay. Our job right now is to find vanadium's charge so that we can write down its name. See, vanadium, I'm going to write how its name should look like. It should look like this, vanadium parentheses oxide. Can you guys tell me why it's going to look like this? Why should I not call this divanadium pentoxide? Uh, it's going to look like that because it's a type 2, right? Yes, it's a type 2 ionic compound. That's why I got to make it look like, look like that. Now, I need to put the charge of vanadium here. I need to put here charge of vanadium. And that's why I need to find the charge of vanadium. Okay. So now we got this formula, V2O5. We want to find the charge of vanadium. And we know periodic table does not tell us its charge. That's why its charge is going to come from oxygen. Now, what is the charge of one oxygen? We got five of them. What's the charge of one oxygen? Negative two. Negative right. two. And that comes from periodic table. And we got five of them. So this gives me a total charge of negative 10 on this side. This side for me is negative 10. Does that make sense, guys, so far? Right. Okay. Since this side is negative 10, this side for sure has to be positive, okay? 
because it's a metal side. This was the non-metal side. That's why this side was the negative side. This side is the metal side, so it has to be positive. Okay, and this side has to be negative. Now, if this is negative 10, this side will be plus 10 because we want to neutralize the charge. We're going to cancel out the charge. Negative right. 10. Now, if this is plus 10, can you guys tell me what is the charge of one vanadium? Um, divided by the two that's uh, Right. Right. So you see this here. You got to divide yeah. this by two, and that makes it five. So that means the charge of one vanadium here that goes into is, the final number is five. Yeah, right. so that means the charge on vanadium is plus five. Okay. Do we have more questions? Whoever asked this question, did that make sense? Or Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, it did. So another question too about pertaining to this, um, since we don't know, is it always, or like the middle, is the middle part of the PR table always going to be um, type two because there's no charges to be exact yes. or not really? Yes, yes. But then we learned, if you check your notes, you guys learned yeah. that nickel is plus two, zinc is plus two, cadmium is plus two, and cobalt yeah. is plus two, and then silver yeah. is always plus one. You got to memorize these ones. Okay. Say that again. Which ones were the plus twos? Cobalt, nickel, okay. zinc, okay. cadmium, always plus two. Okay. Okay, and then silver, A, A G, and A U, silver, gold, plus one, plus one. I mean, silver is always plus one, A U still changes. So uh, in your notes, just put silver is always plus one. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you do one on isotopes, please? For isotopes, what you're going to see, guys, is what do we mean by so first of all? If I give you these two or three examples, okay? Now, guys, X is not a symbol. This is like a variable X, okay? So it's unknown name, X, X, X. And then let's say I put a number here, 20 and 40. And then I put a number here, 20 and 41. And then I put a number here, 19 and 41. By looking at these three guys, can you guys tell me which of the two are isotopes of each other? Can you guys look at this and tell me which two are isotopes? It'd be the 40, 20, and 41, and 20. Yes. So these first two, right? Yeah. They're iso Why are they isotopes? Because their atomic numbers are the same. Same atomic number. Guys, what do we mean by isotope isotope are the one they're 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 versions of the same atom out of these three atoms which of the atoms are same atoms only these two 20 20 this 19 this is a different species this is a different element this is a different atom it has a different atomic number sure. okay so th these two last two cannot be isotopes or this last one the first one cannot be isotopes because they're different atoms. They have to be the same atom with a different atomic mass to be called an isotope. So that's what you should know about isotopes. So we're not done solving it yet though, I can imagine, right? The solving part is a different type of question. Uh, that's yeah. average atomic mass. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you got to check your textbook exam, I mean, your example I did in the class where I gave you two different isotopes and their abundance, and then you figured out its atomic mass. For those okay. questions, uh, you will be asked to find the average atomic mass. And average atomic mass is equal to the abundance 
that's a different question, okay? Abundance times atomic mass. And if you're given, let's say, three different isotopes, you have to do each one. So abundance times atomic mass. And so we have three versions and you, you will do the same to the third one, abundance times atomic mass. Okay, now if you guys have already taken the quiz, you must have already seen an example like this. Okay, so you will be given, let's say three different species. Uh, one is 60%, one is 20%, one is another 20%. So let's say we got three different, uh, these are the abundance. And then oh. given the atomic mass, let's say the atomic mass is 13.46, 13. Point, let's say, sorry, say a different number. 14.58, and then the third one is 15.23. Let's say we got, these are three different atomic masses, okay? And these are three different percentage abundance. This is the data that you're given. Then you will plug them into this formula that we just learned. Then you'll get the average atomic mass, okay? So let me solve this for you guys so you guys can see it. The abundance, will, so this is for the first one, this is for the second one, this is for the third one. This is our first one. This is our second one, our third one. So right. for the first one, the abundance is 60%. We need to change this number from 60% into a non-percentage non number. So we'll change this to 0 0.6000. This number will be changed to 0 0.2000. Basically, we're moving the decimal places two to the left. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, but okay. I'm going over so both are, so both are 20 percent, right? What's that? Both are 20 percent, right? On this chart, yeah. so I mean, in this that. case, yes, they are, but they don't have to be, right? Right, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, the total always will be 100, that's why I did 20 20. Okay, okay, so first abundance is 0. 0.6000, and then times atomic mass, the first atomic mass is 13.46. So you plug that number here, that's your first number. The second is 0 0.2000 times 14.58. And so is the third one, 0 0.2000 times 15.23. So the idea is whatever your abundance is, times the mass, abundance times the mass, abundance times the mass, and then you add them together. Okay. Do have to use sig figs on this one? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the sig figs will come from the atomic mass that you're you're Okay. Okay. So the answer, do we have to um, note that that would be the average weight of the abundance or can we just give you the number? I mean, once see if you, You'll have to show your work, and at the end, whatever answer you get here, just put that answer here, and that's your that if if that's correct, you'll get all the points. Okay, I got thirteen point three six eight for this answer. How much? Uh, thirteen point six three eight. Thirteen point six three eight. Yeah. I don't know if that's correct or not. I hope it is. It should be. And in that case, since since we're going to go by sig figs, where would, where would we go in that case? So, you see, you, you're multiplying the numbers, and then you're adding them, right? Right. See, this 0.6 or 0.2 or this 0.2, uh, so that, let's see your sig figs for each one, okay? So, when you multiply, you look at significant figures. This is how many sig Okay. This is four significant figures. This is also four. This okay. is four. This is also four. Four, 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 four. So all of them are four significant figures. You multiply this, it gives you four six figs. You multiply this, it gives you four six figs. Multiply this, it gives you four six figs. 
can you tell me what is the first number you get when you multiply 0. 0.6? Let me do that here. 0. 0.6 times 13.46. It gives you 8.076. Then the second one is 0. 0.2 times 14.58. That's 2.916. And then the last number is 0 0.2 times 15.23. That gives me 3.046. So these are numbers that I got when I multiply each one of them. Okay. All right. So first four and four six figs. So this this is first number of 8.076 is coming from multiplication of four and four significant figures so i can trust four numbers one two three four. four for the next one also i can trust four for the next one also i can trust four okay now when you add these numbers you get 13.68 for addition you look at your decimal places this has three decimal places three decimal places three decimal places so I can keep three decimal places. So this is my final answer. Okay. All right, that makes sense. That one was a little trickier to throw that part. That's what I was asking. Let me just double check that the math is right. 8.076 plus 2.916 plus 3.046. Well, I think it's actually 14.038. So 8.076 plus 2.916 plus 3.046. Yeah, the answer is 14.38. Yeah, it's not this. Wonder why wonder why I got that plugged in the calculator too though. Gave me that. Yeah, this is 14.038, and that will be your final answer. All right, guys, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Okay. So, you got, you guys, do we have more questions? We got just, we got like seven, eight more minutes. Um, get. Yeah. I um, wonder if she does. I wonder if she does. I think she does. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, could you go over um, was it law of multiple and definite proportion? Law of mul Okay, so they're actually pretty simple. What they say is, uh, you gotta understand first of all what they mean. Okay, so there's law of definite proportion, and then the second one is law of multiple proportion. So the first one is saying that if you have uh, carbon dioxide and you go and take a, a carbon dioxide sample from uh, Menifee or you go and get a carbon dioxide sample from Riverside, it's going to be CO2. It's not going to become CO or CO3 or CO4. Okay. Whereas law of multiple proportion says uh, that when carbon and oxygen needs to combine, they can either combine to give you CO or they can combine to give you CO2. So it's saying that when carbon and oxygen combine, they don't always combine in this ratio, one is to one to give you carbon monoxide, but they can also combine in this ratio to give you carbon dioxide, okay? Right. Multiple, you see that carbon and oxygen can combine in multiple proportion, either one to one proportion or one to two proportion. That's what our multiple proportion tells us. On the other hand, Love definite proportion says if carbon and oxygen uh, combine to give you carbon dioxide, then no matter where you take the sample of carbon dioxide from, it's going to be carbon. It's going to be CO two everywhere. Now again, oh. to me, they seem very simple because we all know this, but at the time when people had no idea about carbon atom, oxygen atom, at that time this was a big deal. Okay. All right. So the way you're going to be asked this question on the test. I'll say, okay, uh, carbon, if I have one gram of carbon, 
and it combines with, uh, let's say, eight grams of oxygen. I'm just putting out the numbers, okay? Don't trust these numbers. I'm just giving an example. So yeah. when I say that I go and get one gram of uh, carbon, and I found out that it had eight grams of carbon attached to it, then I went to get another sample where I had one gram of carbon, but it combined with, but it combines with, 16 grams of oxygen. By looking at this data, what do you guys suggest? Will you suggest that this is telling us law of definite proportion or law of multiple proportion? Yeah. By looking at this data, what does this look like? Law of definite proportion or law of multiple proportion? Uh -huh. Multiple proportion? Yes, it is multiple, but why? Because the eight and two multiply, right? Eight multiplies, so you can get two. Yeah, so that's also true. Right, right. That's, that's one way of looking at it. Or you can see this. Every one carbon, one gram of carbon is combining with eight grams here. But here, on the other hand, you had the same one gram of carbon, but somehow the oxygen went up. It went up twice. That means these are two different types of carbon and oxygen combination, okay? So they, are both, they both cannot be carbon dioxide. If both are carbon dioxide, then one gram of carbon to the one gram of carbon in the second sample, we should have had eight grams of oxygen and eight grams of oxygen, but that didn't happen. This tells us that these two different examples, number one and number two, so this is number one, this is number two, both of these samples are of different compounds. So that's law of multiple proportion. Okay. Does that make sense whoever asked the question? Yeah, thanks. I have a question. So if it sure. would have been law of definite proportion, uh -huh. it would have had the same. Color. Right, right. Yeah. So let me show you that also, okay? There's a way to trick that as well. So I have carbon one gram and combines with eight grams of oxygen. And then I give you a second sample where I have carbon two grams and it has 16 grams of oxygen. Now, is this law of multiple proportion or law of definite proportion? Uh, definite, right? Yes, it is law of definite. Why is this law of definite not, not multiple? Because didn't eight change to 16? Yes. So why is this not multiple? Because here eight changed to 16 and we're calling it multiple. Here, you're not calling it multiple, why not? Because the, because the zeros didn't change at all, just the eight and the sixteen did, right? Which zero? This is oxygen. This is no oxygen. oxygen because because oxygen didn't change, right? No, it changed. It went from eight grams to sixteen grams. Right. But what I'm trying to say is that it just basically went up by eight grams of oxygen, right? Basically, in a way. Yeah, here it went from eight gram to sixteen grams. Same thing happened here. Look at these two data guys carefully and tell me what's the difference. The grams went up for for the carbon for the carbon. Okay, so you see, one gram carbon has eight gram of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So this I I got the sample from many of you. Okay, then okay. I came to Riverside and I found out that two gram has sixteen gram of oxygen. Basically, they're both telling the same thing. You see. Carbon went from one gram to two gram. It went twice. Right. So oxygen was supposed to go twice. Right? So they're talking about the same compound. Okay? If you look at this guy, the second sample, every two gram of carbon has 16 gram of oxygen. I can also say if you had one gram, then you would have eight grams of oxygen. So basically, okay. this sample is same as this sample, one gram eight gram, one gram, eight gram. You see the ratios are staying the same. For every one gram of carbon, you have eight gram of oxygen. Now, for this two and 16, if I bring this down to lowest whole number ratio, uh, one gram has eight gram of oxygen. So this is also law, of, uh, so this is law of definite proportion because they're both telling me that for every one carbon, you have eight grams of oxygen. Are you guys able to understand that? that? Yeah, so this means yeah. we bring it down to its lowest um, whole number ratio. Yes. Whole number ratio. I yes. get it. 
you you see for this first one one two eight one two sixteen it's already lowest whole number one gram one gram yes. that's it. why this eight and sixteen is telling me that the carbon amount for same amount of the carbon for these two samples for the same amount of carbon my oxygens are different right. so that's log multiple proportion when I see here, when I bring this guy, second one down to lowest whole number ratio, two to 16, I make it one to eight. I see that this is one and one, but this is eight and eight. So this is telling me that they're actually talking about the same compound. To every one gram of car carbon, I have eight grams of oxygen. So that's law of definite proportion. So this here is definite proportion. And this right here is multiple proportion. That makes sense, guys? Yes. Okay. I'll take one last question. It's already 1 p.m., guys. I got to go, so I'll take one last question. Try density, as I think some people have been getting confused with density. Okay. Does anyone also have a question on density? Yes, please. Okay. What about density, guys? Sometimes I'm confused about once you multiply the density versus when you uh, divide density. Yes, exactly, so same here. Density is mass over volume, right? Right, yes. You're never gonna change anything, guys. See, it depends on what you're looking for. Let me ask you this, x is equal to y over z, okay? Mm -hmm. If you wanna find x and you're given y and z, you just plug in the numbers for y and z and you divide and you get the answer, right? Right. What if I'm asking you for finding y, then y is equal to what? Uh, x, right? You know, what is y equal to? If I'm, if I'm looking for y and I give you x and z, then what is y equal to? Zx. X. x times z, right? Yes. So that's what we do here. If you're looking for mass, let me erase this bottom part. So guys, density is mass over volume. If I give you mass and I give you volume, go with this formula, density is mass over volume. So you just divide them. If I'm asking you for mass, then mass is gonna be equal to what, guys? Uh, that's the density times volume, right? Density times volume. So this is when you multiply. So you just need to ask yourself what you're looking for. You gotta ask, see in the question what you're given. Now, what if I ask you for volume, guys, and volume will be equal to what? Volume density times mass? No. Okay. Yes, you should know how to move, how to shuffle these guys. I'm looking for volume. So how will you isolate volume? Uh, mass times volume? No, I'm looking for volume. Oh, okay, uh, density times mass. Nope. Anyone else? Okay. Let me give you guys a quick trick, okay? Okay. Your density is mass over volume. And I'm looking for this volume. I want to isolate this volume. By isolating means, I want to bring this guy over here. So guys, just do, whenever it's multiplication division, just do this crisscross. Take the volume here and bring the density down. So volume will be equal to, so I'll take volume up and density down. Mass stays where it was. You don't need to move the mass. That's how you find volume. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, that makes sense. So basically, yeah. since you just asked for volume, you just move the density down under mass, correct? Right. So you, you guys should have some method to yourself on how you're going to isolate these guys. Okay. okay. So if I'm if I'm giving you mass and volume and asking for density, you don't have to do anything. Density is mass or volume, just plug that in and find the answer. If I'm asking you for mass, you use this equation. So you multiply these two guys, density times volume. Okay. If I ask you for volume, then you use this equation. So you, you don't have to memorize these. You just memorize this one and you should be able to isolate these other two. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so I'm gonna stop right here. Okay. And then I'm gonna be posting this uh, video. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna record. So this is always recorded, and then I'm gonna upload this on uh, on the canvas. So you guys can go over that one again if you want. Each ones that you each sessions you do, you put them on Canvas, correct, Amon? Um, I, I didn't do the first one because uh, there were only one uh, or two students. It was yeah. there were not too many questions. Like today, one we have we had covered too many things, so I'll post this one. Whichever I'll feel like is good enough to post, I'll post that. Okay, but okay. well, we'll get the email knowing we we post it's on there, right? I mean, you probably won't get the email, but you can just. No, find it on canvas once I upload it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And well, I guess we'll see you yeah, tomorrow. Any questions on for the exam in particular? No, uh, you said they're 20, 25 questions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean by free response questions? That's what I've been thinking about lately. Like you see this abundance question, atomic mass, average atomic mass? Right. Yeah, that's a free response question. All the nomenclature is free response, which means... You have to okay. write down. It's not multiple choice. Okay, but when it comes to sick pigs and all that, it'll be multiple choice, right? Yes, that's multiple choice. Okay. All right. All right. That makes sense. Okay, guys. So I'm gonna stop the meeting, and then we'll see you guys tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Bye. See you, Mon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.